I would go visit those churches, but yeah, uh, you know, I couldn't necessarily highly recommend them. And then I don't even remember exactly how, but I found out about Brother uh, Pastor DeLello uh, shortly after that. And so I remember I sent her another email. I was like, hey, forget about those ones I told you about. And I, I found out there's one that he, that's actually good. Uh, and so I, I, I get burdened every time somebody, you know, calls me or emails me, hey, do you know of a church in this area? And, and there just isn't one that's just preaching right on, you know, on salvation. It's so disappointing. And so I, I'm so thankful Four churches that are preaching the truth and pastors are standing for the truth. And so uh, I'm very thankful to have gotten to know Brother Lolo. And I'm very thankful to be here tonight. If you want to go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to start reading in verse 11. I'm going to read a passage to you and I'll let you know what I'm going to be preaching about tonight. But it says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body fitly joined together, compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working, in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. I want you to notice what it said there when it talked about uh, in verse 13, till we all come in the unity and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. What I want to talk about tonight is perfecting the saints. That was one of the reasons that God gave, says he gave the apostles and prophets and teachers for the perfecting of saints. And pretty much, you know, whenever I get asked to preach in another church, you know, I, I don't know the crowd in that church. I don't know what they need. I don't know all your faults and problems like I do with the people in our church. And so it's a little difficult. So sometimes, you know, you ask the pastor, hey, you got anything specific you want me to preach on? And, you know, and he didn't give me anything specific, all right? He didn't give me a list of anybody's sins. So I was just like, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I just want to be a help. I want to be an encouragement. I'll preach something that, I'd like to get preached to our church, all right? And, and I preach this stuff to our church, uh, too. But, um, you know, one of my goals as a pastor, and I don't know, you know, I don't know Brother DeLello enough, enough to know all his goals and just kind of how he operates and how he thinks. Not every pastor does everything the same. But That's right. me personally, one of my goals, and I've told this to our church before, one of my goals as a pastor is to get our church to a point where I could drop dead and the church will be fine. And everybody will just do great, and the church can go on fine without me. That is one of my goals as a pastor, is to get my church where they don't need me. And it's not that I want to go somewhere else. It's not that I'm not happy where I'm at, but I just, to me, that would be a comforting thing to just know that, hey, if I were to leave, if I were to drop dead, Liberty Baptist Church would be fine. And so that's kind of one of the things I'm working towards and so I'm trying to perfect the saints. I'm trying to make them complete. I'm trying to make them better. Amen. I'm trying to get them to grow up and be self-sufficient people that can operate on their own. That don't they don't have to have me cracking a whip. You know, they've got a relationship with God. They know the book themselves. And then that way too, if I do die, you know, they're not gonna they're probably not gonna bring in some heretic to take my place because they're gonna know some truth. And hopefully I'll have somebody in the church, you know, raised up Amen. that could just step up right there and just take over. That's one of my goals. And so I do, I like, I like doing things because I want to, not because I have to, you know. And when you start a church, it's like you feel like I have to get this thing going. You know, I have to, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like I have to do it. And I want to get to the point where I don't feel like I have to do it. And it's not, once again, I don't have any goals to go away, but I do, I want to be to the point where... Our church is going to be fine no matter what. That is my goal. And, you know, I think about back when I, um, years ago, we, I just went full-time into the ministry when I was in my last church, and I took a pay cut going full-time in the ministry, and as a result, we racked up some debt, and I remember we ended up finally, we paid it all off for like two years. We scrimped and saved and worked, uh, you know, did everything I could. We paid it all off, and it was just a very liberating feeling to know that I am not financially trapped where I was at. And you know what? 
when I got to that point where I did not feel trapped where I was at, it made me love where I was at even more. It made me, you know, by the time I ended up, Lord ended up calling me to start Liberty Baptist Church, I was as happy as could be where I was at. I didn't really want to leave, but I felt like that's what the Lord wanted me to do. And there is, there's this, it's a, it's a great feeling to know that you're free, you can do whatever, and everything's gonna, and everything's gonna be fine. And so, what is it gonna take to get this church at that, you know, at that place? What's it gonna take to get my church at that place? where everything's going to be fine. Well, we've got to perfect the saints. And so some things that we've got to do is I, we've got to have people in our church who are following Christ and not just a man. Amen. One thing that always breaks my Amen. heart, and I've seen this, you know, I, I, my last church I was at, I was there for 23 years. And I was there for a long time. I got to see a whole generation grow up. And, you know, people, they come and go. People move away. And it always bothered me how people would come to the church. They supported the church. They seemed like they were on board with everything. But as soon as they move and they go somewhere else, everything changes. I mean, everything about them changes. They go to a completely different type of church many times. And it's like, were you ever one of us? You know, but it, the truth is, many times these people, they were just dependent on the pastor. They were dependent on my dad. And then they ended up going to a church where they didn't have a very good pastor. And guess what? Then they weren't very good Christians when they didn't have a good pastor. And we need people who are willing to follow Christ, not just man. Look at chapter 5. Okay, chapter 5 of Ephesians, in verse 1, it says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor, but fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you Amen. as becometh saints. And he goes and he names off all these sins. Hey, none of these people are going to inherit the kingdom of God we, and if you're, and he says right here, you need to be followers of God as dear children. You've got to have a personal relationship with God. Okay, I understand you're being saved is just by believing on Christ. But after you get saved, you know what? God wants to get to know you. God wants you to get to know Him. He wants you to learn something about His Word. He wants you to keep His commandments. Right. We don't have to quit sinning to get saved, but we, if we do need to quit sinning, if we want to have a good relationship with Christ, Amen. we do need to start doing better if we want to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's things, the Bible says, let it not be once named among you as become a saint. And a church that's going to make it, a, a church that's going to do right, they've got to clean their lives up. We're going to be sorry Christians, or we're going to be sorry soul winners if we just got a ton of sin in our life, I'm going to have a tough time witnessing to my neighbor if, you know, I just right. saw him at the bar the night before. And I was right. getting drunk with them. I'm going to have a tough time. I Every once in a while this happens to me. I work a part-time job in a factory. And every once in a while when I'm not knocking on doors, I knock on doors of my coworkers. And you know what? If, they, if I just cuss them out the day before at work, I'm going to have a tough time winning them Amen. to Christ. Amen. And I'm telling you, we need people that are following following Christ and not just a man. He's telling, Paul's telling him, be ye followers of God as dear children. You know, your pastor is not going to be perfect. And you know, that what's sad too in many ch churches, sometimes the pastor does go bad. Sometimes the pastor ends up falling into sin and he ends up quitting church. And you know what usually happens? Half the congregation, they quit too. They quit going to church. They quit serving God. They quit doing what they're supposed to do. You know why? They weren't following Christ. They were just right. following a man. Right. And you need to be following after Christ. And you need to, and you know, once again, your pastor is not going to be perfect. And you should follow him. Uh, well, I'll show you a verse on that in a little bit. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But understand, too, one thing I wish people would remember, and I wish our church would always remember this, too, is one of the qualifications for a bishop is not perfection. All right? That is not in there in the qualification of a bishop. And I thank God for that. Otherwise, I'd be disqualified. And so, you know, if, but here's the thing if all you know, is what you've learned from your pastor, you're, you're going to be in trouble. You know, hopefully one of the things you learn from him is pick up your Bible and read it. You know, learn something, get something out of it. Start following these things. Um, you know, God didn't save you just so you could walk with your pastor, but so you could walk with yeah. him. Now, some of these things I'm saying, I don't think Brother DeLow is this way. I know some pastors that they don't want their church to be able to be fine without them. They don't want their people to be independent without them. You know, they, they don't want them to be able to you know, it's like they want them to get their permission to breathe. You know, it's like, I'm not like that, all right? And maybe that's why I'm not the greatest pastor of the world. Maybe that's why I haven't built a mega church yet. 
I'm I'm just I'm just not that way. I don't want to be babysitting people all the time. Amen. Okay. I know some parents they raise their kids to be kids forever. I thank God my kids are are getting older. I thank God I've got a son that's got a driver's license that I can send on errands for me now. That our kids that can babysit themselves. I love it. I I I, I absolutely love it. As parents now, we can just do some of the things we want. This next Monday, we're probably just gonna we're gonna leave the kids home, and we're gonna go away for our anniversary. They might they might go stay at grandma and grandpa's, but you know what? We don't have to take them there. My son can drive, and you know what? that's thrilling to me. All right, that is absolutely thrilling. And if you have little kids, you know you just you, those days seem so far away. But you know what? They're gonna come. They're gonna come when you know your kids get older and can do things by themselves. But I that's what I want as a pastor. I want a church. I want church members that know how to walk on their own. I don't have to hold their hand for every little thing they do. I remember when we had three little kids, and just driving somewhere was a challenge because we had to buckle three kids in a car seat. That was hard. That was a pain in the neck. And I remember how thrilling it was when our kids could buckle themselves. It was just. It was. It was a great milestone when that day came. And you know what? I don't want to be a pastor that just has a whole bunch of babies that I just got to take care of all the time. That I'm constantly bottle feeding. I want them to grow up. I want to be able to do some things yeah. on their own. One of my, the most thrilling things for me as a pastor is when stuff is getting done in my church and I'm not doing it. I love it. I, I love it that soul winning is still going to be going on this Saturday and I'm not going to be there at my church. That, that just that blesses my heart. That, that, th that thrills me greatly. When we started our church... Nothing got done if I wasn't there doing it. Nothing. And you know what? That's part of starting a baby church, but I'm glad our church is growing up. And it's not like that anymore. I don't have to do everything. I can be gone on services occasionally. And I can't wait till I can just like, hey, you know what? Assistant, you take over. I'm, I'm going to go visit some other church. <laughs> I, I can't wait for that day to come. We're, we're not there yet. But I hope that day is going to come. But part of a pastor's job is to cause people to fall in love with the Lord. Turn over to John chapter 3. So we got a lot of pastors today. It's like their attitude, they just want the people to just love them, be dependent on them, and, and that's fine. You know, love your pastor, but at the same time, you know, as a, I'm not the main show, all right? Liberty Baptist Church is not supposed to be about Tommy McMurtry. It's supposed to be about Jesus Christ. And I, I tell you, I know a lot of preachers that, that are not like this, all right? I've grown up around some of these guys. I know these people that, um, they do not have a John the Baptist mentality. They love talking about being Baptist, but they, they don't act anything like John the Baptist. And I love this passage right here. It says in verse 26 of John chapter 3, And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Amen. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. I love that verse right there. He must increase, I must decrease. Amen. You know, when you reach a new convert for Christ, you know what, as, as a pastor, or if you're somebody who led them to the Lord, you know, they are, they're very dependent on you. But you know what, hopefully a day comes where they don't need you so much anymore because they have a relationship with Jesus. They now have a walk with God themselves. And you know what, when that day comes, I'm not going to be jealous about that. I'm going to be thrilled. Hey, I don't have to take care of you anymore. Hey, I don't have to help you with every little thing anymore. I'm all for helping my church people. I'm all for being an encouragement. I'm all for answering questions. But I, I want them to get to a point where, you know what? Hey, they've got a relationship with Christ. I don't have to be the one praying for them all the time. They know how to pray and get their prayers answered. They know how to find answers in the scriptures. And if they, if they had a tough spot, I do. I want to be there. I want to encourage them. But I love seeing God's people grow up. I love it. It's an exciting thing. And I do, I want people to fall in love with the Lord. This isn't about me. I want to get a bunch of people falling in love with Jesus. That's my goal. And we need, if a, if a church is going to get to the point where they are, they're a real church. It's a whole body of believers, not just one guy doing everything. You've got to have people that are following Christ and not just a man 
And that's something, you know, you're not going to just get a relationship with Christ here in church. You've got to go home and you've got to read your Bible. You've got to be praying yeah. on a regular basis. Yeah. You absolutely need what you're getting here, too. You absolutely, this is a necessity. I do not believe I would continue to be a good Christian if I quit going to church. Amen. I'd like to think I'd be right. fine, but you know what? I Honestly, I know me. Without church, I don't think I'd be a very good Christian. If I forsook the assembling, I just I don't think I would. I, God's people motivate me greatly. Our church members, they motivate me greatly. And, you know, I, I, I don't think I'd do a great job. But at the same time, I need more than just what I get in church. I've got to be doing my own Bible reading. I have my own prayer time. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So notice I mentioned, you know, we've got to have people that are following Christ, not just a man. However, we need people, too, who are following their pastor. The last thing we need a church needs is a whole bunch of discord, a whole bunch of people all trying their own thing, and everybody's got their own agenda and their own thing they're trying to do. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. It's Paul saying, be ye followers of me, even as also I am of Christ. Okay. It's like, well, I don't believe in following a man. Well, you know what? You're fine following a man as long as he's following Christ. And Paul said, be ye followers of me as I follow Christ. Well, what if our pastor quits following Christ? Well, then don't follow him. But if Amen. he's following Christ, follow the man. All right? Go ahead. Follow his example. Do, you know, pay attention to what he's doing. Learn from him. Verse 2, now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So we see, you know, that there is an authority structure. And notice too, Paul's telling them, hey, follow after me. But understand too, and this is back to being self-sufficient and following God. It doesn't say the head of Christ is the pastor. Amen. I was in a, I was in an evangelist or a, or the head of not the head of Christ. I messed that up then. The head of the man or the husband is the pastor. I was at a uh, meeting one time. The preacher got up and he was like. Children are under the authority of the mother. Mother is under the authority of the husband. And the husband is under the authority of the pastor. He's like, now you might not like that, but that's Bible. And I was like, wow. I had my Bible ready. I was like, well, where is he going to go for this one? He didn't go anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't go anywhere. Right. Understand the pastor is the head of the church, but he's not the head of your home. And you know what? We're going to have a real sorry church if we have a bunch of sorry homes. And we need good Amen. homes. We need God. We need godly men that are running the home. We need godly Amen. women that are in submission to their husbands, right. and godly children that are in submission to their parents. But once again, you, you are allowed to follow after your pastor when it comes to the things in the church. When it comes to the things of the house of God, God gave the pastor for the perfecting of saints. We read that passage. That's one of the purposes of the church, and God placed the pastor there as the head of the church, just like He placed the husband. As the head of the home. The church is a separate structure than the home. Okay? Amen. When a pastor wants to be the head of your home, he's now stepped outside his area of authority. Amen. Okay? But when a pastor's trying to be the head of the church, okay, he's doing what he's supposed to do. All right? That's exactly what God's called him to do. Look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1. Make a mess of my notes up here. It says. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, not taking oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Y'all see that right there? The pastor is not a lord over you, but understand he is an example. All right, that's one of the things he's supposed to be is an example, one that you could follow. His job is <clears throat> to feed the flock of God. And then look what it says in verse 4. And when the chief shepherd, which is Jesus Christ, who is Amen. the head of the church, Amen. shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourself unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Notice when it talks about submitting one to another, hey, that takes some humility, doesn't it? You know what? You know, 
I'll, I won't say this about this church, but you know what? There's people in my church that are probably smarter than I am. They have a higher IQ than I am. The people in my church that are better than me in certain things. You know, I'm not the greatest in the world at everything. All right? I'm, I'm just not. But you know what? God's placed me as the pastor and people submitting to me. You know what? That takes humility, doesn't it? Yeah. That ta it takes yeah. humility to submit. You know, it takes humility for a woman to submit to her husband. Especially in this day and age where that kind of thing is frowned on. Yeah. And guess what? Women legally don't have to submit to their husbands, do they? I mean, this is America, folks. If my wife wanted to, she can say, you know what? You know, I want to divorce my husband. He was a mean husband. You know, he was uh, said he was my boss. He made me wear skirts. He made me go to church three times a week. You know what? Man, they'd give her divorce and probably let her have all the kids. Yeah. Then she'd get all my money, too, which wouldn't be much, but she'd get it. And then, then I'm in big trouble. That's America. But you know what? She humbles herself, and she submits herself to me. Amen. And God sees that. And you know what? When you're willing to do that, I mean, even if you, let's just say by some stretch of the imagination that, you know, when you have a disagreement with your pastor, you're right. All right, let's just, well, let's just say if that ever happens, all right, it's never happened in my church. No, I'm just kidding. But if, hey, if that happens, you know what you do? You humble yourself and you say, you know what? God placed him as the pastor, not me. And you know what? I'll submit to him. I think it'd be better if we did things this way, but you know what? I'm going to help him out. I want to help this church. I want to advance this church. God placed him as the overseer of the church. So you know what? I'm going to be a blessing. I'm going to humble myself. And you're like, well, I don't, I don't know. You know what, if, what if he leads me the wrong way? That's why Jesus said after verse 7, casting all your care on him for he cared for you. Okay? God's the one that pa placed Pastor Tim here yeah. as pastor of this church. Amen. God's the one that placed you here in this church. And so you know what? If, God, if something needs to be done with him, say, you know what, Lord? I'm going to give this to you. You deal with him. You speak to his heart. In the meantime, I am going to humble myself and I'm going to submit I'm going to do the right thing because I want this church to go forward. I want this church to do great things. And so I'm going to, I'm going to submit. And you know what? Because when authority structures get turned around, we have chaos. And we have that in homes today, don't we? Where many times it is the wife that's the head of the home. Yeah. Some cases it's yeah. the kids who are the head of the home. Right. That, right. You know how many people have come to my church who they like the preaching. They liked me. But their kids didn't like the church. We didn't have enough fun stuff for the kids to do. You know, the Fun Center Church had a lot more cool things that the kids could do. And so the parents like, yeah, we're going to go over to that church. Yeah. You know, we know you're preaching the truth over here, but, you know, the kids, it's like, really, you're going to let the kids yeah. run the home? You're gonna, the fir our first Sunday we had, a mom and dad came walking in with their little three-year-old kid. And uh, their three-year-old kid, he decided that he didn't want to be there. And he didn't want to go in there, and they're, try they're talking like, well, what, what do you want to do? And he said, go home. And he walked out the building, and they followed him. Oh. And I thought, how sad. And, but, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I get, that kid, I guarantee you, is going to turn out to be a monster and end up in jail or something like that. I mean, just the chaos follows when things get turned around. And God placed the pastor at the head of the church. And, you, and what we need to do as, you know, as church members is you just got to submit. Humble yourself. Humble yourself and do the right thing. And you're gonna be, you'll be blessed by that. I'm going to show you more scripts on that in a little bit. But, you know, when, for example, when the woman's the head of a home, it's a mess. Not because there's anything wrong with women. They just weren't made for that. Okay? That's not their place. God did, not, God did not create them for that. Okay? And... For, so for me, for example, okay, there's nothing wrong with my hands, all right? My hands work pretty good. There's nothing wrong with my feet. My feet work good. But can you imagine if I had my feet transplanted up to my hands and my hands transplanted <laughs> down there? All right? Now, that wouldn't work real good, would it? These hands wouldn't make very good feet. And my feet wouldn't make very good hands, all right? Just, you know, just picture that, okay? Well, that's what we have when the wife's trying to be the head of the home. And when you have church members trying to be the head of the church, when God didn't place Amen. them there. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You say, oh, that, that's, that's just goofy. That doesn't make sense. Why would you, where do you come up with a crazy illustration like that? Well, I kind of got the idea from the Bible. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 14, right. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, 
is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? Y'all see that? I got, so you got the idea from the Bible right there. And you just need to say, Lord, what is it you've made me for? What is my place? What is my position? And then you know what? You go and you do the very best job that you can. Right. You know what you do? You try, you try to help your church the best way you can with whatever gifts God has given you. Amen. And you stay in your place. Church members need to try to help accomplish the goals of the pastors. You know, we don't need committees voting on every little thing. You know, we, do, we do voting in our church on certain things. I just preached a message about it this Sunday, but good night. Some churches that I know, I mean, they, they have committees for everything. And it's just ridiculous. And you, know, you don't need to do that, alright? If the pastor upgrades their brand of toilet paper to something a little softer, it costs a little more money, you know, don't quit the church over that. You know, that's, that's just not worth it. I heard a guy one time, he came to his pastor, and he was all mad. He went and he looked in the closet, and he found three brand new brooms. Three brand new brooms that were perfectly good. And he's like, you know, why do we need three of these things? That's, a, that's such a waste of money. Man, he went and he called up the pastor, and he chewed him out. He's like, Pastor, we are wasting money in this church. So three brand new brooms. We only have one person cleaning the church at a time. Why do we have three brooms? That's such a huge waste of money. And the pastor, you know, he's real apologetic about it. You know, I guess we should be more careful in that stuff. And he was talking to the church treasurer about that, who, you know, would buy a lot of the things and supplies for the church. And he's like, hey, you know, why did we do the three brooms? You know, I I don't know. You know, brother so-and-so was really upset about that. And then he just told the pastor, well, you know, he had good reason to be upset, pastor. He's like, really, why is that? He's like, well, think about it. If all the money you gave for a whole year went to buying brooms, you'd be upset too. (laughs) And sometimes the people who contribute the least complain the most. That's just the way it is. And I tell you, I have definitely experienced that in my church. People who help in my church, people who are active, people who are contributing, people who give, I mean, people who work, they never run their mouth. It's the people who don't do anything that want to run their mouth. They do. They come walking into church. They've already got an idea of what they want. And they just, they come, they sit in the pews, and you can just see it in their face. I dare you to give me what I want, Pastor. And you, know, I, and you don't even really know what they want. You know, and then they, they just have this attitude, and they have these expectations. And I just want to ask people sometimes, you know, first of all, what you're asking is going to cost a lot of money. How much money do you think our church has? You know, we've got a small congregation, though, that we don't, we don't even look like we're rich. You know, I mean, and then, you know, Mm-hmm. I work a part-time job. How much do you think I can cram into one week? You know, and, but they don't want to do anything. But you know, the truth is, they want, to, they want to be the head. They want to be the boss without even doing any work. And that said, you know what you need to do? You need to get behind your pastor. And whatever he's trying to accomplish, whatever he's trying to do in the church, you ought to try to make it successful. Amen. That ought to be your attitude. Amen. And you know what? If somebody else in the church is in charge of something... If the pastor gives somebody else a job and this is their job, they're in charge of this activity, you ought to have the attitude, you know what, it's my church, their success is my success, their failure is my failure, whatever's going on, I'm going to help make it succeed. That was my attitude. When I was an assistant pastor, I had certain things that I was in charge of and then there were certain things that other guys were in charge of, but you know what, whatever was going on at Lighthouse Baptist Church, I wanted it to succeed. I wanted to know how I can help, even if it wasn't my thing. Even if the spotlight wasn't on me, I wanted to see it succeed. And boy, when, if you can have people like that in your church and that's their mentality, man, I'm telling you, those people are such a great blessing. Those people mean so much. You know, any pastor of any great church will tell you, if you start asking him about the greatness of his church, he will start, you know what he usually does? He starts pointing to people in his church. You know, this person does that. This, it, it, it's because of the people in the church, okay? I've known some pastors who have great churches that, you know, when I, I just knew them at first, it's like, how does this guy even have much of a church at all? He's not that good of a preacher. He hasn't got that great of a personality, but he's got a great, thriving, successful, successful church. And then I go to that church, and I get to know some of the people in that church. Like, you know what? I see why this guy's got a great church. He's got some awesome people mm-hmm. in this church that's making this church great. And you know what? 
I, I mean, I, I, I've seen proof that you can have a goofball as a pastor and still have a good church if you've got some good people that know their place and are doing what God's called them to do. Right. And I don't think that's the case here. I think you guys got a good pastor. But I'm telling you, you get good people doing the right thing, it will make great things yeah. take place Amen. in a church. But, you know, once again, it's back to that submission thing. You yeah. know, submission takes humility. Yeah. And guess what? What does the Bible teach? God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Okay? God resisteth the proud. That means God's working against you. If you're too proud, if you've got too much pride to humble yourself and to be submissive, you know what? God's going to be working against you. Right. But you know what? He gives grace to the humble. So you know what that means? Okay, and this is the way I interpret that. and I, I, I think I'm right. God gives grace to the humble. Well, hey, we got saved by grace, right? Unmerited Amen. favor. We got salvation when we didn't deserve it. That's right. Okay? So what if I am being submissive? What if I am humbling myself and I am helping out the pastor, I'm helping out in the church in something that maybe isn't perfectly right? Well, guess what? I don't think God's going to curse you. You know what I think he's going to do? I think he's going to give you grace. I think he's going to yep. bless you anyway. Yep. You know why? Because you did what God wanted you to do. You were humble. You, you submitted yourself. God sees that, okay? Jesus Christ sees that who was somebody who humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even though that was not his will. Jesus said, not my will, but thy be done. He uh -huh. humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God had also highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. That's the attitude. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, as what the Bible teaches. So we do, we've got to have people who are following God, but then also, when it comes to, in your personal life, you're following after Christ. You've got a relationship with Christ, but we need people in the church who are following the pastor, and who are uh, humbling themselves, being submitted, uh, submissive, contributing, and then we've gotta have people who are becoming self-reliant. Not just in their personal life and in their own personal walk with God, but, even in the church, too. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse 5. It says, For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles, but though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been throughly made manifest in all, uh, among you in all things. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied in all things. I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. Now, I think he's, he's kind of getting on these people here, and he's telling them, hey, all this work that I did for you, I was able to do because some brothers in Macedonia, they took care of my needs. These guys, they, they gave to me, so I was able to help and I was able to do a work among you. But you know what? There comes a time when we need to stop being the just the takers and we need to become the givers. Yeah. And we need to start contributing. And look what it, and it says in verse uh, 11, Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth, but what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. There are there's a lot of people out there that they are they're false prophets transforming themselves into ministers of righteousness. But they're not, these are people just trying to get followings for themselves. People that are just, they do, they want everybody dependent on them and just needing them. But you know what? Paul's trying to encourage these people. Hey, you know what? Grow up. You know what? You all need to start doing some things yourself. Okay? Other people shouldn't have to be given to me so work can be done here. You all ought to be getting involved. You all ought to be helping. You all ought to be contributing. You know why? Because as a church, we need to be self-reliant. We need to be, you know, we don't have a bad, I tell our church all the time, we don't have a Baptist Vatican that we can get money from. You know, we don't have that. Hey, if work's going to get done, if the physical work's going to get done, you all need to do it. Because we don't have a Baptist Vatican that we can get money from, 
you know, a lot of times there's work that needs to be done. Well, and we don't have the money to pay the professionals to do that stuff, so sometimes we need you all to step up. Hey, let us know what your talents are. You got an ability to do something? Figure out some way to use it in the church. I thank God for some of the people in our church. We've got one guy in our church. He's not an electrician, but he knows a lot about electricity, and he has saved our church a fortune in just doing that, doing electrical work around our church. That because I sure can't do that stuff, but he's doing it, and it it saves us a ton of money. We and we, there's many people they have they've used their talents, nice. and it has helped our church greatly. And, and uh, you need to find out what yours are and figure out how you can use it. Because you know what we do, we want I want our church to be a point where we're self reliant. We don't need support from other churches. We don't need it. We don't. We don't need those things. Hey, we're the ones supporting other churches. We want to be like the Macedonia Baptist Church. Hey, we're given to help other works get started. But you know what? Even when we help to give other works started, we help to. Uh, you know, so we we've supported some new church plants. We do that, hoping that church will eventually become self sufficient mm-hmm. and self reliant. Hopefully, they'll reach some people, and those people will grow up, and they'll start contributing. They'll start uh, help meet their pastors' needs. That, that's, our, that's our goal. They need to be self-reliant. Um, but, you know, we're not going to take time to turn there, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul, he's, uh, in his first letter to the Corinthians, he's kind of getting on to them too because of the fact, you know, he's, he mentions that if we've sown unto you spiritual things, is a small thing if we reap your carnal things. He's like, hey, others use this power over you. He said, we never charged you for anything. Has anybody here ever gotten a bill because Pastor Delello preached a message to you. Did he ever send you a bill for that? All right, yeah, somebody raise their hand. <laughs> did, he, did he send you a bill because he visited you in the hospital? You know, if, if, if he's ever, if you if you came to this church because he knocked on your door soul winning, you know, did he send you a bill because he came by and he did that work? No, he didn't send you a bill. But understand that work that, he, you know, the work that he does, he's still, he's got a family. He's got to, he's got to provide. He's got needs that need to be met. And he doesn't send a bill for those things, but somebody's got to take care of that. Somebody's paying them. I always tell people in my church, hey, one way or the other, God's going to take care of my needs. Yep. I've got another right. job I do too that I, I'm hoping to quit eventually at a Walmart distribution center. But I, and I said, you know what? And God's going to bless whoever meets my needs. And you know what? God's blessing Walmart greatly right now. And I said, I would rather you all get the blessing. I would. God's blessing them greatly. Right. I, I think it's just because they've got me working right. for them. I think it's all going to go downhill once I quit. Uh, probably not. Probably not. They're pretty powerful. But at the same time, I do. I believe that. God will bless them. And he says, you know, uh, he makes the statement in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, but I have not used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For, for better for me to die than that any man should make my glory and void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Paul said, you know what? Whether I get paid, whether I don't get paid, I'm preaching the gospel. You can't stop right. me from doing it. You know what? Whether right. I get paid by my church or not, I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to minister to the people the best I go. can. I'm going to win souls the best I can, whether I get paid or not. But you know what? I want our church to be perfected. I want it to grow. And I, it's God ordained that they that preach the gospel live of the gospel. I want that. And as the people contribute... And as the people make that happen, God is going to bless them for that. Yep. And I do, I want our church yep. to be a self-reliant church. And he did. He says, you know, others, they use this power over you, okay? And you don't have to get it. If, if a plumber comes over to your house, how many of you have ever had a plumber go over to your house, and he did work for you, and then later the dirty rat sent you a bill, <laughs> all right? Now, you all would think the pastor was a dirty rat if he did that, and I don't think a pastor should do that. The Bible says, you know, we don't use that power, but, you know, technically, if we wanted to, we should be able to. Plumbers do it. Doctors do it. They ch- doctors charge a ton for what they do, don't they? Mm-hmm. You know, electricians, mechanics, those dirty rats, mm-hmm. just because they fixed our car, they think they can send us a big bill. And then we have to pay it. If they don't, you know, they'll turn over collections and things like that. They can even take us to court and sue us for that kind of stuff. Think about that. But you know what? A pastor never does that. But yet a pastor's got to eat just like a mechanic. A pastor's got to have a house just like a doctor right. or an electrician. Right. And boy, I'm telling you, when we do, when we have a church that's taking care of those needs, so that just helps the pastor do more. You know, once I go full-time, our church is doing fine right now, but you know what? Once our church is able to support me full-time, 
that's just going to make us where we can do even more. Right. There's going to be even more soul winning going on, even more people right. getting saved, Amen. even more things happening. And so we need, we've got to grow up. People got to get involved. They've got to start contributing. But you know what? Said it's not about the money. And I say this, right. I mean this with all my heart. If my church fired me tomorrow, great. I'm going to start a church down south where it's warm. I'm sick of getting snow in April. Right? I don't even want snow in January. You know, I'll, do, I'll go start a church down south tomorrow if they fire me. The only thing keeping me in Illinois is our church and the people that are in our church. I, I love those people. They have, they've been a great blessing. I thank God for them. But if they fired me, I don't have any obligations anymore. You know, I, I'd be, my feelings would be hurt a little bit, but I'd get over it once I'm down you know, in Christmas. It's warm. You know, I, I'd get over it real fast probably after that, but it's, it's not about that. I want to I wanna be full-time because I, I want to do more for the Lord. Amen. And you know what? And if, if my church people, if they are, if they're taking care of my needs so I'm able to do more, that God's going to even bless them more. That's yeah. better. That's better for them. So God's going to take care of me one way or the other. So uh, look to, uh, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm kind of going along in some of these things. So another thing that we're, we see that God needs, first of all, you know, we've got people that have a relationship with Christ. They're following after God. We have people that are following their pastor. They're getting behind their pastor. We've got a church, meaning the believers, they're self-reliant. The pastor doesn't have to tell them every little thing to do. They're in their place. They're faithful. They're working, they're contributing, they're helping out. We've got to have those things. But then you've got, they've also got to be people that can be relied on, people you can actually count on. A pastor is an overseer, okay? And sometimes that overseeing, it takes a, it takes a lot of time with certain people. There's some people, their help creates more work. You know, it's like, you know, I, I just, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm too busy to have you help me. You know, I just, I haven't got time for your help. I've known people like that before. But 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a couch potato. <laughs> Is that what it says? Or a, a pew warmer, I'm sorry. No, a soldier is what it says. And you know what? It's not easy serving in a church. It's not easy helping out in a ministry. You know, but you've got to be, you've got to, you got to stick to it. You've got to be faithful. You've got to endure hardness. You're going to go through tough times. There's going to be times where you do, you, I mean, you just pour yourself into a project, you work hard, and you know what? Nobody cares. Maybe you're trying to plan some big event. And hardly anybody shows up. And you know what? It takes the wind out of you. It's disappointing. But you know what? Be faithful. Right. Just keep on going. Don't right. quit. Just do the right thing. You know, endure hardness. Well, somebody criticized me. Yeah, that stinks. It stinks when you just give your all to something and then somebody nitpicks. They find one little thing that you did wrong after all the work you put into it. Yeah. And then they just want to run their mouth about it. They didn't do anything. You did everything. But they want to run their mouth. That stinks. But you know what? Endure hardness as a good soldier, Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's what we've got to have. Because you know what? I'm telling you, the devil's going to send those people in here that just, their gift is running their mouth. That's it. They're, they're going to be good at it. Their gift is finding out everything that everybody else does wrong. Their gift is being an expert on how everybody else should do everything. But they have no ability to do anything on their own. Those people are going to come... And they can. They can be very discouraging. But you know what? you got to endure it. You say, you know what? Hey, in the end, I'm serving the Lord. You know what? I might not be appreciated here on this earth, but in the end, I'm serving the Lord. I'm going to do what He wants me to do. And God has put me in this place to serve, and I'm going to endure hardness. I'm going to be committed. This is, this is my church. This is not just Tim DeLello's church. This is not just Tommy McMurtry's church. I want the people in our church to have an attitude. This is, this is my church. Right. You know, the success or failure of Liberty Baptist Church is my success or failure, not just me. I have never wanted our church to be a one-man show. And there's been times I felt like it. There's been times where I just, I feel like I'm just, I'm doing everything. And it's just like, 
and everybody's just sitting out there watching me do everything, and it's like, folks, this can't be that entertaining, you know? I would, you know, and, and, and I'm not, you know, I mean, and maybe that's one of the reasons I'm a pastor too, but, you know, I'm, I'm not one to just sit and watch other people do stuff. One thing I can't stand is watching a bunch of, you know, instruments get up and play, like Smoky Mountain instruments, guitars, banjos, mandolin. I can't stand watching all those people play. I want to play with them. I, I, I enjoy playing those stringed instruments. When I hear that going, I, I, I want to play. When I, was, when I was younger, I used to play around on a lot of those instruments, and I would listen to it all the time, and I never could just listen. I had to play along with the tapes all the time. That's just how I am. I want to get involved. I, can't, I don't want to just watch a bunch of people go soul winning. I want to go soul winning with them. Amen. And listen, I enjoy preaching too. I really do. And, don't, and, I, and I enjoy singing. And don't take this the wrong way, all right? But I am my favorite singer and my favorite preacher. I really am. And it's not because I think I'm the greatest at those things. I just love doing it. I love it. I love listening to a good special. I absolutely love listening to a good special, but I'd rather sing the special. And I know I'm not the best singer. All right? I know I'm not the best preacher, but I just love doing those things. And it's just not enough for me to just sit and watch all the time. I want to get involved. I want to, I want to contribute. I want, I want to do something. I don't want to just watch the ball game. I want to play in the ball game. That needs to be your attitude. And when you come into this church, you know, not everybody can be the pastor. Not everybody can be up here preaching in the sermon all the time. But you know what? You can make something happen in this church. You can help. You don't want to, I mean, just, just little things. Even just singing out in church with a smile. You know how encouraging it is to come into a church and just to hear loud, happy singing? That's encouraging. You know, and you don't even have to be on key for that. My favorite singing in the world is listen to a choir, just get up and belt it out. And my favorite person, anytime you hear a choir that's just one of those that just really sing out, they've always got that one person that's a little off. But they're like the most excited person in the choir. I love that. I, I, and they are my favorite person. That one that's a little off, but man, you can just tell they love the Lord with all their heart and they're singing from the heart. They are my favorite person in the choir. I like them better than, you know, you know Miss Sourpuss who has perfect pitch. You know, I could care less about her. I want to see that one that's just doing all they can. And we, and we do. We got people who are committed. People who've shown some consistency. Who've weathered some storms. I've been there before when you're looking out in the congregation, you know, and you've got the people that are all over the place. And you've been trying to minister. I mean, you, you know, I, are these people going to stay around? I'm probably going to lose them after this message. You know, like, Lord, please don't have me preach that this week. You know, they, they will never come back. You know, and boy, I'm telling you, it is so nice when you can get up in a congregation and you're like, I can preach whatever I want. I can preach whatever the Lord lays in my heart. And thank God that's how it is at our church right now. I mean, I, I preach whatever I want. And I like it so much, if I start getting people in my church that don't like it, I'm doing it anyway. You know, it's, like, it's, it's so great. These pastors who are afraid to preach the truth because they're scared of their church members, man, they don't know what they're missing. They don't, they don't know what they're missing. Once, once they start doing it, they're never going to want to go back to the lame stuff ever again. Amen. They're not going to want to do that. And they do. Yeah. When that those people come in, they're going to have fun scaring those people out the door. Yeah, all right, I'm, I'm putting up with that. We're going to have liberty at Liberty Baptist Church. But you know, people, you know, you know, people are watching. People are looking for consistency. You know, and if we're constantly jumping from one thing to another, you know, no one's going to listen to us. And most people will never be a successful Christian in any area simply because they just give up too soon. You know, they just, they give up too soon. The Bible says, be not weary in well-doing, mm -hmm. for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If you're like me, well, when is that season, please? I need to know the date. <laughs> the Bible doesn't tell us, but it does say in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Amen. So just don't faint. You know, don't quit. Don't give up. But a church that gets to this point, it's going to be a church where the pastor, he's got no reason to fear preaching the truth. He's going to have people who are spiritually mature. Therefore, you know, they're probably, they shouldn't have lives that are a mess. They'll actually be in a position to receive the blessings of God. And then, of course, they're going to start accomplishing great things for God. They'll, and they'll be able to do these things with great joy and with great liberty. And, folks, I mean, I, I wish you knew just how blessed you are to have a pastor that believes like your pastor does. I mean... I'm telling you, there are, there are a lot of places right now, you know, begging for somebody like that. And when you have that, boy, you know, thank God for it. Get behind it. 
you know, you, you all are part of a beginning of, a, I, think, I think, a great church. And, so, and you know what? If you follow these things and you have this mentality, there's just no telling how God is going to bless your church. And you're going you're gonna to love it. But you know what? We can't faint. You're going go, to go through some seasons that are going to be difficult. But if you do, if you stick it out, you stay faithful. I've been around the ministry long enough. I can tell you, you're gonna, you'll be glad that you did. There were many uh -huh. times in my dad's church where he went through some really difficult battles. And I remember there was a few times I'm like, man, you know, maybe I ought to just start all over and go somewhere else. But you know what? He stuck it out, and the Lord ended up blessing him better than ever before. Mm -hmm. And you do. You just you gotta you gotta stay faithful. And let me tell you, there were there's been many times since I started my church where I'm like, you know, where's the escape hatch? You know? <laughs> and I have really I you know, unfortunately I didn't have any. <laughs> unfortunately I didn't have any, you know, and it just I, I had to I had to stick it out and you know what God blessed. And I am I'm to the, I'm to the point now in our church where I have no desire to go anywhere else. You know, I there was a few times after we started, I was like, yeah, man, I should have went down south. Where it's warm, you know, especially I think it was our second winter there. It was horrible. It was just so stinking cold. But you know, now I'm like that. But at the same time, I gotta admit, I do feel like I still need to be around for things to move forward. I, I feel like I'm still there right now. We're not there yet, where I could drop dead and everything will be fine. But you know what? That's where I want to get. And when I get there, what are you gonna do? Go somewhere else? No, I'm gonna enjoy being there. I'm going to enjoy feeling like, hey, I can go start a church in Hawaii tomorrow if the Lord called me, you know, and everything will be fine here. But it doesn't mean I'm going to, but I do. I just love having the liberty of knowing I'm doing what I'm doing because it's what I want to do, and it's what God wants me to do. And when you have a pastor that's preaching and serving in liberty instead of in prison, but, you know, people have bad attitudes in prison and jail. I used to work in a jail ministry for kids. They had bad attitudes in jail. You make your pastor feel like he's in a prison, he's probably going to have a bad attitude. You make him feel like he could do whatever he want, go wherever he want, be whatever he wants. You're going to have a happy guy. It's going to, you're going to be a better preacher because of it. And so I hope you all will do that. And I, I do. If you do, I know God will bless you. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your blessing. We thank you for this church. Dear God, I pray you'll bless it. Lord, I don't, I don't know everybody in this congregation. I don't know what the needs are. But dear God, I, I know that these are the goals for my church, Lord. I want our church to be just fine without me. I want... Uh, the people in our church to be fine without me, Lord. I, I want a congregation of people that just love you, that love the house of God, that love the people of God. And uh, Lord, I pray that you will uh, make all those things happen in this church. I pray you'll use these people to accomplish great things in this area. I pray you'll bless Pastor DeLello as he tries to lead this church. And I pray you'll help all of them, Lord, to be clothed in humility, Lord. And, and you've already promised that if they'll do that, you'll give them grace. And so we don't even need to ask for that. We thank you, knowing that you'll do that. In your name we pray. Amen.